I learned something this last week, and I, I love learning new things, um, as long as they're true. Yeah, amen. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, it's our basis, it's our foundation of what we're learning. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself, transformed into an angel of light. Uh, remember that that statement matches Isaiah 14 in the name of Lucifer. Lucifer means bearer of light. An angel of light is another way of saying the same thing. It's like two eyes looking at the same picture. Two different angles, but they're seeing the exact same thing. And that's what you get when, with the phrase angel of light. It's a bearer of light, messenger of light. He's transformed into that, but understand that his nature is, he is a bringer of darkness. He, um, the God of this world has blinded the minds of men and he causes people if you ever if you ever ask the question if you know cults like jehovah's witness their beliefs are so off from the bible and in some cases ridiculous why do people believe them why do people believe that even though the Bible talks more about hell than it does most other things, uh, it gives you exact description of hell, it gives you people that are in hell, their eyewitness testimony, when it speaks on these things, and yet, Charles Taze Russell and the Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe it. They choose not to believe it, saying that the Bible must be wrong and they're the only ones that are right. What Have you ever encountered someone that was like from a cult or something like that and you tried to talk to them and it's like it got nowhere and you ever have you ever had that anybody Aaron you have yeah you have okay so it just sometimes it just boggles my mind how we can all read the Bible and have it everything plain as day here and yet some people just they don't get it and, they, and for some reason, they don't believe it. Um, Isaiah, let's see, where am I going? Isaiah 20, I want to say 29. There is a, um, a possible, yeah, Isaiah 29. There is, to me, I think, a plausible theory to that. To why some people just don't get it um, here ha here is the Bible greatest book in the world greatest book ever and it is the re it is the revealed nature of God his description of both heaven and hell in the spiritual world areas that we cannot see and yet people just don't believe it they believe some things out of the Bible but other things, like important things, they don't believe it. So, Isaiah 29, verse 9. This is where the prince of darkness comes in. The, the one who transforms himself into an angel of light. He is actually the God of this world who blinds the minds of men. Isaiah 29, 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Verse 10, here it is. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. And it closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. There are a lot, there are people in this world who are a lot more, I would say, intelligent as far as the their IQ is concerned 
a lot more intelligent than me or you, and yet they believe some of the dumbest things in the world. They believe you can bow before a statue of Mary, and that statue is going to hear your prayer and make Jesus do something for you that he doesn't want to do. And these are, most Catholic priests are very well educated. They speak multiple languages, they've read books that you have never even heard of, and so on. But for some reason, there is a, there's a big darkness over their mind. Um, I remember the story of Martin Luther, who uh, was a Catholic monk in a monastery, a German monastery, and um, he, he basically became a monk because he wanted to be closer to God. And he has secluded himself in this monastery. He spends countless hours praying, reading the scriptures, and then flagellating himself. Taking a flagellum and literally scourging his body because he was told that that purges out all your sinful urges. And he's reading the book of Romans and he sees in there uh, what Paul was talking about, the righteousness of God. And as he's reading this, he's just getting angrier by the minute. Because here he is, he has secluded himself from all public life. He spends hours praying, reading the Bible, and then beating himself bloody. But he still cannot change his vile nature to match the righteousness of God. He still has wicked urges and impulses. And he can't. And he, so he just beats himself harder, prays longer, fasts, reads the Bible more, and repeats. And he does this over and over and over again. He cannot make himself attain the righteousness of God. And he's angry at God for insisting that he must be that holy and he's doing everything that he can to get that holy, it's not working. And it never will. Uh, anybody tells you they, they are, they're lying through their teeth. So what happened with Martin Luther? The Holy Ghost turned a light on for that man. Because everything that he was doing was just compelling him and driving him into deeper darkness. Had it not been for the Holy Ghost that automatically, just one day, just turned the light on, and Martin Luther realizes, reading the book of Romans, that it is not his attaining of the righteousness of God. It is Christ covering Martin Luther with the righteousness of God, so that when God sees Martin Luther, he sees him the exact same way he sees Christ. He sees him as totally without sin light came on and from that point forward he's no longer the best friend of the Roman Catholic Church he is taking them on head on they had a trial over that man accusing him of blasphemy and heresy he's the one that wrote out 90 what was it 98 95 95 thesis reasons why the Catholic Church was lying through their teeth and nailed it to the uh, gate of Wittenberg wanted everybody to read what he said about his bosses, the Catholic Church. So that's a little bit of boldness. What happens for various reasons, God judges all mankind. This is the scary part. God judges all mankind. And God either looks upon a soul and says they are redeemable, I can work with them, I can teach them, I can train them, I can give them light, and he'll do that. But others, he looks at their soul, looks at their life, the outcome, and he says, can't be done. If, listen, if God can't do it, it can't be done. So God takes people, verse 10, pours out upon them a spirit of deep, Sleep. It's a spirit. And have closed your eyes. The prophets, your rulers, the seers hath he covered. He's covered preachers, prophets, 
uh, whole churches, denominations, you name it. In verse 11, then the vision of all is becoming to you as the words of a book that are sealed. That's, you could say, that's, there's a picture of that, it's called the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is a sealed book, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. You can give them a Bible, but they can't understand it. They're not capable of understanding it, because... God has given them a spirit of deep sleep. Consider um, Israel. Go to 1 Corinthians. Is it? Let's see, where is it? Well, let's see here. I'm going to have to paraphrase because I'm not finding it right off the bat. But anyway, uh, God is, or Paul is talking about Moses. And he's talking about the glory of the Old Testament, but the glory of the New Testament is greater. And he says that every time the Jews read the Old Testament, there's a veil over it. And that's typified in the, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai the second time, he had been in the presence of God. And his face was shining so bright, they could not look at Moses' face. And um, so they asked Moses that when he comes out among them, put a veil over his face so they could at least look in his direction. And Moses did that, but when Moses went into the tabernacle, he took the veil off because he could be in the presence of God. But anyway, the idea is that to this day, the Jews are still reading the Old Testament but they're reading it in a veiled form or with a veil over their mind and God will not allow them to understand it. Okay? Now, that's scary because when God judges somebody like that, He's either doing it temporarily because He's going to let them wander in the wilderness for a while and He's going to teach them a lesson or... God's doing it on a permanent basis and they're never, never going to understand the light. They're not going to do it. And uh, we see in the case of Israel, uh, if we turn to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. I learned something about poison. Serpent poison. That just really was interesting to me. But with... Numbers 21, there was a reason why God sent the serpents in among the Israelites to bite them, and many of them died. They had it coming. So, Numbers 21, verse 4. While you're turning there, here's, here's the gist of what I'm saying. If you know somebody that you've tried to reason with them, you've tried to talk to them, you've tried to give them verses... You've tried to, I mean, you've prayed for them, obviously, but you've, you've exhausted all methods of trying to reach them for the gospel, reach them for the truth, reach them with just some simple things out of the Bible. Um, and they won't, they won't believe it. They won't, they don't want, they don't want to hear you. They don't, they don't want you bringing this up anymore. And so on. You may not be able to see this, but God is signifying that he's doing that to that person for a reason. And more than likely, there is some sin or there's some rebellion or there's something there that not everybody can see, but God can see it. And this is why he's turning them over to that. That's the scary part. Um, I hope that well, I'll just say this. I have many, many occasions been on my face before God saying, God, please do not turn me over to a reprobate mind. I don't want it. I want to know the truth, even if it hurts. I want to know the truth about me. And I want to know the truth of the word of God. 
So Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. So the, the very first part of verse 5, the people spake against God. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's, I don't recommend that. Okay? I have been, I've been angry with God. I have questioned God. I have not understood why God was doing what he was doing. Um, there's just a lot of things that, about God that I don't know. And sometimes, well, you all know this, sometimes God's got to hurt us a little bit to help us. That's what a good father does. But to just speak against God and testify against him. Um, I don't recommend that. If you want to go talk to God alone and say some things to him, then go do it. Okay? And then say, God, you're going to have to help me understand. You're going to have to help me get through this because I don't, I don't want to be angry at you. I don't want to be angry at God. I don't want to be mad at him. Just because I don't understand what he's doing. And so I've been many times to God saying, God, please help me understand. Keep me going because I don't want to be offended at you. I don't want to be upset at you. I don't want to speak out against you. Um, so they spake against God and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Um, I was looking up snake venom last night and um, I watched some kind of helpful videos to kind of help me out with this. There's at least four different ways that a snake can kill you or make you really, really, really sick. Um, I'm going to try to, this is, I just started looking into this, so I don't have a, a really good grasp on how all of this works. Or even some of the words, proteolytic venom dismantles the molecular surrounding uh, and where the bite is and including the bite. So what that venom does is that it takes all the cells of your body where the venom touches and it just tears them to shreds, okay? Completely dismantles all the cells. Like if you get a snake bite, I saw one last night, a guy got bit on the foot and they showed the first day after he got bit and then they showed like a week later after he got bit. He had holes that big around in his foot where the venom had just destroyed. What it does is it breaks down the cell wall of every kind of cell that it touches, skin, blood, muscular tissue, you name it. It, te it tears down the cell wall and just basically dismantles to shreds every part of your cell. And whereas you had skin and bone and flesh there a week ago, you have a big empty spot where that stuff used to be. It's because it just shredded it and completely did away with it. Now, think of what a cell represents. Cell represents the tabernacle. What happened? Uh, what happened in Shiloh? When they first came into Is the land of Israel, when Joshua first led them in, the first capital of Israel was, in the land, was a town called Shiloh. That's where they set up the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant and everything like that. But because of Israel's negligence, because of their sin, because of their turning to other gods, God literally destroyed Shiloh and dismantled the entire tabernacle. They had the furniture left, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, things like that. But the tabernacle itself was gone. So that, and it stayed that way until David became king. And he wanted to build a house unto God. God went and let him. So he said, at least I'll bring the Ark of the Covenant to me. And we know that story as well. The temple that Solomon built, 
because of Israel's sin and their rebellion against God and serving other gods, God destroyed Solomon's temple. They built another one. It was around in Jesus' time. Jesus said, destroy this temple. And he said, Matthew 24, there's going to come a time, there's not going to be one stone left on another here. It's all going to be destroyed. A.D. 70, that's exactly what happened. It was wiped out. Okay? And you can say that it was because of the sinfulness and the wickedness of Israel. Hemotoxic. What does that sound like to you? Hemotoxic. What is hemo? Blood. Okay? Act on the heart and cardiovascular system. The heart is the throne. The blood is the life. And I've, I've seen, I've seen how this works. They'll take blood, human blood or whatever, and drop just a little dab of that venom into that blood, clots it up in a matter of seconds. Okay? And what that causes is cardiac arrest. Um, one case, this guy injected a little bit of venom into a frog's heart that was beating. And within a matter of seconds, that heart just stopped. And it just, it'd kill you right then and there. I think that was from a brown snake. And thank God we, we don't live in Australia. Sorry, Australians. Okay. Uh, neurotoxic. This is what's interesting to me. Neurotoxic acts on the nervous system and the brain. Remember what the brain is. The brain is the head of the body. That's Christ. The brain speaks to the body by way of the nervous system. That is the Word of God. That's the Bible. So what happens to people who get bit by the serpent? What happened to Eve? Here, God had given to Adam His Word, His commandment, a covenant. And that is, you can live in this garden, eat of the tree of life forever. If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat of that, you shall surely die. So God made a covenant. God gave his word to Adam. Here is Eve. The devil comes. He doesn't bite her. He speaks to her, but it's poison nonetheless. And what it does is that it dismantled God's law in her mind. So she doesn't, she is not affected by the word of God. This I see a lot of. I see a lot of people because they have, they have been poisoned by the serpent. It affects God's ability to communicate to them by way of the Word of God. How many of you believe that one? That right there speaks volumes because there's, there are people, I used to do this with Brady all the time. I mean, Brady was a Jehovah's Witness. I would sit and I would just dream up ways that I could nail him over the phone. I would just try to think of Bible ways and Bible verses that I could shoot at him to make him realize how wrong he was. Usually about hell or about the deity of Christ. And I'd just wait by the phone for Brady to call me the next time. Sure enough, he'd call. Brady, I got something I want to share with you. And I would come up with some verse that to me just proved the deity of Christ. And he'd reach over and grab his New World Translation of the Bible and he would read it to me out of that and I'd, and I'd be going, man, they got that one too. The New World Translation systematically goes through every place in the Bible and destroys the deity of Christ. And to my knowledge, they haven't left anything undone in the New World Translation. That's why it's so dangerous. And so I was never able to convince Brady from the Bible how wrong he was. Okay? It was God who did it. God is the one that pulled him out of it. And I thank God for that. But the idea is the, certain's, the serpent's poison. What he convinces people of. What he tells them. It's like they're immediately inoculated against the Bible. You can give somebody Bible verses until you are blue in the face and they're not going to believe it. That's because of the neurotoxic venom that they've been poisoned with from the devil. How many of you believe that one? Uh, maybe some of you used to be that way. 
The devil had you convinced the Bible was a bunch of hooey and you didn't have to believe it. Um, Alexander Scorby, who read the entire Bible, to me the, the greatest reading of the King James Bible, Alexander Scorby died lost. After having read the entire scriptures, he died lost. He didn't believe it. Isaac Asimov, science fiction writer, wrote, uh, there's a movie called I, Robot. He basically came up with those ideas. There was, Isaac Asimov wrote a commentary on the Bible as an atheist. He wrote a commentary on the Bible. I don't know how you do that, but he did. And I've, I don't have a copy, but I knew someone that had one, and they showed it to me, and I read through it. And it was just basically Isaac Asimov denying practically everything the Bible said about God and the deity and creation. And he basically takes it, and it's like he just nullifies the entire Bible. So he not only read the Bible, but he studied it and still didn't believe it. That's the venom of the enemy. Will not allow the word of God to have any effect in their life. Cytotoxic. You may want to guess what that is. Cytotoxic. Anybody know? Cyto is a word for cells. Okay. Um, this might go with the hemotoxic. The, the red blood cells are the transportations of the body. Red blood cells go in the lungs, they pick up air, and they distribute that oxygen to the body. The red blood cells, uh, they pick up nutrients from what you eat, and they deliver that to, to the entire body. So the body has oxygen, the body has nourishment. But serpent venom targets red blood cells and absolutely destroys them. And red blood cells are all shaped like this. They're shaped like little bowls or cups. And that's because they carry material to the cells so your body can live. And the venom will destroy those red blood cells, and just pulverize them. So your body will not, the key parts of your body are not going to get oxygen. They're not, how long, how long can my hand live if I wrap a rubber band around my hand how long can my hand survive with I cut the blood supply off to my hand if I listen to my mom it was a matter of seconds every time I put a rubber band around my wrist you're gonna cut the circulation off your hand and lose your hand mom okay it probably take longer than seconds how long can your brain survive without oxygen a rubber band around your neck Not very long. Beg your pardon? Did you hear what she said? She said she didn't try that one on me. Yeah. My sister used to threaten me. And I never called her bluff. In order to get me to do what she wanted, she would lay on her bed and hang her head over the bed and say, if you don't do it, I'm going to let the blood rush to my head and it'll kill me. And I start crying. What was I thinking? <laughs> Mike, where's your sister? She's dead in there. She hung her head over the end of the bed. I let her get, I let her do it. <laughs> Worked every time. Anyway, that's what the devil can do to people. His poison, the poison that comes out of his mouth, is designed to kill you. And it's designed to separate you from the head, God. It's designed to do that. Even if it's just a little lie for a temporary time, where you can... Maybe believe something the devil said and you kind of get away from God for a day or two or a week or two or whatever. Uh, it's still poison. It may not kill you right then and there, but it's still poison nonetheless. The only antidote to all of this is the Word of God.
When the devil says, don't believe the Bible, that's exactly what you need to start believing. And the Bible say, when the devil says, don't read the Bible, that's exactly what you need to start reading. What you need to get your mind and your heart into. When the devil says, don't pray, God's not going to hear you. That's exactly what you need to start doing. And begging God for help so that you live and the devil has to go away. Well, uh, back in uh, Numbers 21... The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. See, see what their sin was. Their sin was they spoke against the Lord and against Moses. Now Moses is the mediator. They say to Moses, Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us, and Moses prayed for the people. That is a picture of Christ being the mediator. They knew that they couldn't go to God, because God was the one angry with them. So they went to Moses, and Moses always spoke up for the people, because he was among them. And so Moses prayed, and God said this in verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten... When he looketh upon it shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Jesus is going to give you the meaning of this. Numbers 21 is one of those places in the Old Testament that is establishing the doctrine of belief for salvation. Belief for salvation. I thought I was, while you're turning there, I thought I was doing pretty well this week. I've taken some of my medicine out of my daily routine because I want to know the difference between what are symptoms and what are side effects. And some of the medicine I quit taking when I got back from Kenya, and I have not had the sweats in a week. But today, I've got them. Now, I don't feel so bad because I see Megan with her fan on back there. So maybe it's just the humidity. I don't know. But I have not felt, I have not been wiping sweat off me for a week. So we'll see how it goes. Anyway, John chapter 3. Um, let's look in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The book of Colossians says that Christ made a show of his enemies on the cross, triumphing over them in the cross. And he nailed his enemies when Christ died his, the power of his enemies died with him. It's just like, just like a John Wayne movie or something like that where he's fighting the enemies and the enemy's coming in and John Wayne or somebody decides they're going to be a hero and they're going to kill all the enemies even if it means dying themselves so the rest of everybody can live. Um, American valor is full of stories like that where guys will throw themselves on a grenade or they will single-handedly take on the enemy so that everybody else can live and go free. That's what Jesus did. He drew his enemies to himself and then trapped them there on the cross so that when he died, they were destroyed with him. That's what that... I, you, when I first read that, I had to go through this thing in my mind, Jesus is not the serpent, I know that, so what does this mean? And then I read in Colossians where Jesus was, he was showing his enemies while he's on the cross. And that's why he said what he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have ever, uh, eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, all of us have been bit and poisoned 
by the serpent. Some to worse degrees than others. Some perish because of that. But the antidote here is very, very simple. It's not magic words. It's not a potion. It's not eating the communion wafer and drinking the, the fruit of the vine. It's not a church religious ritual that's performed on you. It is a simple act of belief that what God said is true. Um, there is nothing in the American Medical Association journals that says if you are bitten by a snake, make a snake on a pole and look at it, and that'll cure the venom. There's nothing there. That's not what medicine says to do, but it's what God says to do. And what God was establishing here was the idea or the doctrine of belief. Since God said to do this, all the Israelites had to do was look at the serpent on the pole that, that Moses made. That's all they had to do. Now, if there was somebody whose heart was still turned against God, they would say to themselves, that's foolishness. I have nothing to do with that. And they don't believe it. And because they don't believe it, they're not going to look. And if they're not going to look, they're going to die. And they did. But those who cried out to Moses saying, Moses, pray to God because I've just been bit and I don't want to die. Moses built the serpent on the pole. Moses told that person, if you'll look upon that, you'll live. God will heal you of the venom. And they did, and it was gone just like that. And that, again, is teaching us whenever the serpent poisons us with his words. Telling you it's okay to sin. Telling you it's okay to turn your back on God for a while. Telling you all sorts of lies that he... Telling you that you're not really saved. Telling you that you're, pro you're not going to make it to heaven anyway the way you are. So why don't, why don't you just quit this thing of acting like you're saved in front of everybody and just go back to the old lifestyle. I see some of you shaking your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That's a lie. The antidote is the word of God. Read it and believe it. Okay? And you'll recognize, man, I just got bit. Okay? There's various toxins in the animal world. Uh, to me, a bee sting, it won't kill me. I don't like them. But I don't worry about dying from a bee or a wasp sting. My wife does. She carries an EpiPen in her purse everywhere she goes. Because if she gets stung, she's afraid she might die. Okay? Don't want to take a chance on that, do we? Okay? She's got some confidence in that EpiPen that if she gets stung and she administers that, that's going to save her life. Okay? It's no different than with the Word of God. When you detect that you've been poisoned, that something isn't right. Somebody, somebody said something to you. You read something on Facebook. You saw something in a YouTube video. It doesn't sound right. That's the Holy Ghost saying it ain't right. Your responsibility is to go directly to the Word of God and say, God, you show me whether what I just heard was right or not. The first prophecy meeting I ever went to, 19, I'm going to say 1997, 1998, somewhere around in there. The prophecy club sent this guy to St. Louis. He had all these dreams and visions that God gave him. He had prophecies about how everything was going to happen. So I went to see him. And I took a notebook and I wrote down just about everything he said. And on the way home that night, I prayed all the way home. God, maybe he's telling the truth, maybe he's not. I don't know. But God, I don't want to believe what he said simply because he did a really good job of presenting it. If it's not true, I don't want to believe it. And if it's not true, I believe your Bible is. 
and I want you to show me whether or not what he said was true or not. If you'll do that, I promise you, it may take God a while to get you there. Maybe God has to build some framework of knowledge and understanding. But if you'll do that, God knows that you're being sincere about it, and God will never, never allow His saints, His holy ones, to fall into that kind of nonsense. He just, what did Matthew 24 say? That if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. What that's telling you is, it is not possible to deceive the truly elect. God will not let you fall for any kind of that nonsense. Okay, now we all have our beliefs that we're wrong about. I get that. But there are some more serious than others. It's just like the difference between bit by a brown snake or stung by a bee with me. If I were to have a choice, I would take being stung by a bee. I'll get over that one. The brown snake, I don't want anything to do with it. And so what I'm saying is the devil's mouth is full of poison. And we already know from what he did to Jesus that he's not above using limited portions of scripture to support one of his lies. Because that's what he did. He used a very little tiny piece of scripture to push forward one of his lies to Jesus. And Jesus saw right through it. He knew it. And he didn't fall for it. So, be careful. Is it okay to just know part of the Bible? I say in nowadays, no. It is your responsibility to know as much of this Bible as God will teach you. Don't be lazy. Don't be foolish. Okay? We're talking about your soul. We're talking about your families. We're talking about our church. We're talking about our community. And it's going to get worse as time goes on. We need to know as much about the Bible and as much of the Word of God as we possibly can. Amen? Father, help us to understand. Teach us, Father. Renew us in knowledge. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. The seven spirits, Lord, are there because it is your desire that your people not fall into deception, not fall into temptation. So God, teach us your word. Lord, give us a hunger for it. Give us a thirst for it. God, that it's not quenchable by anything else except reading and knowing the word of God. Make your people students. Make your people disciples. Learners, God. With the things that I know, Father, I'm not satisfied. Because I understand that there are things that I don't know that I want to know. So, Father, renew us in knowledge every day. Teach us something new every day. And we're not too old and none of us are too young to learn something new from your word. So, Father, teach it to us while, the, while it's still light outside. Blessing on your word today. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.